What is up? Welcome to another edition of the NFL Fantasy Football Show presented by DraftKings. It's me, your man, MG Marcus Grant. Still masking and socially distancing when and where necessary. And uh, an interesting week five Sunday. A lot of surprising results on the field. A major injury that is going to shake up both the NFL and the fantasy football world as well. So we'll talk about that with Kimmy Checks. We'll talk about some waiver wire pickups that you might be needing to make for the week. Also looking at some guys who have not been performing lately and whether or not it's time to either put them on the bench or maybe move them even to the waiver wire. But uh, before we get into any of that, a big note coming up for this past week. Uh, we thought there was going to be a Broncos Patriots game played this week. In fact, it was originally supposed to be played today on Monday, but that game has been rescheduled to week six. So we played on Sunday as part of the week six slate, a 1 p.m. Eastern kickoff that game you can see on CBS. All right, before we get into the meat of the show, let's talk to our faithful producer, Senior Edward L. Murphy, Esquire. And Murph, I know it was a rough weekend. The Yankees lost, the Giants <laughs> lost. But I know, but you're a Notre Dame guy, and at least Chase Claypool had a big day. So that that was something, I guess, to look forward to, right? Marcus, I, I, I do appreciate you bringing up uh, the one bright spot of uh, Notre Dame football who beat uh, Florida State. And uh, and then, yeah, Chase Claypool, who I've I've always loved. And Notre Dame's had a good stable of receivers throughout the years that I've been watching. And Claypool, just a, a freak of nature, tight end build and a like a receiver athleticism body. It's I mean, it's just he's insane. Four touchdowns. Um, the, you know, the Irish win on Saturday, which is the, the bright spot. And I'm trying to push the uh, the disgustingness of the Yankees and the Giants just out of my brain. I'm, I'm tired of being the disgruntled fans so i gotta find the the silver lining hey wherever you can i, I will say this about chase claypool i didn't quite know how he would fit because you mentioned he was sort of a, a tight end wide receiver hybrid and i didn't know mm -hmm. how the steelers would use him but i'll tell you what i, I mean obviously the huge game yesterday but they seem to have figured out how to use him i'm i'm, I'm impressed with what i've seen so far mm -hmm. Right, yeah. I thought uh, at least his rookie year with Big Ben, it's just a guy that you're going to line up out wide. You're going to throw like that goal line fade to and let him go up and get it because he could do that. Um, and they seem to just really develop him to be a full, complete receiver, kind of like what he was with the Irish. I mean, he's a great deep ball threat. He could block well. He's a big guy. Um, so he's he's really, really strong to help the run game out. I mean, he could do it all. And like this receiver class is looking to be one of the best all time. And uh, Claypool was an underrated guy coming into this draft, and now he's making a huge name for himself. Yeah, we, we were expecting big things out of this group, and it took a, a few weeks, but yeah, we we're a month into the season, and everything looks good with uh, this rookie class. So uh, hopefully it, things continue to progress because that, that's been really exciting to see. All right, let's turn our attention now to Kimmy Checks, who joins us as always on a Monday. And I guess the first thing are, are how are you feeling after the Chiefs' surprising loss against the Raiders? Have you, have you been able to sort of uh, get some catharsis in the last 24 hours? I'm not available for comment at this time. <laughs> you, it was so funny. You tweeted at me yesterday. You're like, I can't checks. How are you feeling? I was like, Marcus, I, I, do I ever tweet at you when your 49ers lose? No, because they lose a lot more often than the Chiefs do. But still, it was, I mean, it was a really surprising game, especially being played at home at Arrowhead. But, you know, you got to give credit to Derek Carr and that offense. They played really, really well. I think our defense was sleeping the entire game. Um, but if you know anything of Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs and Andy Reid, is they kind of needed that, a little gut punch, a little gut check. And uh, they'll look forward to getting back on track and going back to the Super Bowl and winning yet again <laughs> in Tampa this year. But um, it was really hard. It was, it was very emotional for me. <laughs> I was genuinely concerned about your well-being. I mean, I, I just wanted to make sure that you were doing okay. That's all. That's, that's all I wanted. Um, well, let's turn to some fantasy headlines, and we start with a really distressing, sad piece of news that came out of Sunday. Dak Prescott is out for the season, suffered just a gruesome-looking ankle injury late in that game against the Giants, and uh, had to have surgery on Sunday night. So uh, he obviously is done for the year. For anybody who had Dak on their fantasy roster, that is a, a big, big blow. He was playing really great football to this point in the season, so... Uh, that's going to be hard to replace. For the Cowboys, Andy Dalton steps in, and he is now going to be the quarterback for the remainder of the season. So, Kimmy, uh, if you had Dak or if you just have some quarterback issues, how interested should you be in trying to add Andy Dalton off waivers? 
I mean, I think Andy's Dalton's name has completely entered the conversation and he's someone who needs to be considered at the quarterback position. Now, the reason why Dak Prescott had such good fantasy numbers this season was one, because he's an incredibly talented quarterback and all of our thoughts are with him and we hope that he has a speedy recovery uh, on Twitter. He said that this is just a minor setback for a major comeback. So one, prayers up to you, Dak. But the other reason why Dak Prescott was playing so well and had such good fantasy performance was because because of his defense, the Cowboys defense, where they've been abysmal all season, they are giving up point after point after point on the defensive side of the ball. That meant that Dak Prescott had to play catch up. Now the receiving core is still the same for the Dallas Cowboys. And this means good things for Andy Dalton, Andy Dalton, Dak Prescott, not the same type of quarterback, but they do have the same type of offensive weapons. You have CeeDee Lamb, Amari Cooper, Michael Gallup, all of those guys are still intact. And this defense is going to continue to play the defense has played all season. That means that Andy Dalton and the Cowboys are going to continue to play from behind. And that means he's going to have to continue to air out the ball. So yes, I absolutely do think that Andy Dalton's name has entered the conversation and he's going to be a hot ad on the waiver wire this week. We're talking about a quarterback who was a starter for a long time in this league and on multiple occasions led the Bengals to the playoffs. And I know he's sort of, uh, has been maligned because he never won a playoff game and it seemed like he would sort of fall apart in some of the big moments. But when we look around the league and we see some of the backup quarterbacks, I mean, I, I look at Washington having to start Kyle Allen. I look at the 49ers, they lose Jimmy Garoppolo and Nick Mullins completely falls apart. There are worse situations you could find than to have an Andy Dalton come off your bench and lead your offense. And I think the point you make about the Cowboy defense is spot on because they have been so bad. They have been forcing the Dallas offense to throw the football a lot. That does sort of bode well for Dalton. He's got a, a bevy of weapons to throw to, which sort of leads me to my next question. If you have Amari Cooper, C.D. Lamb, Michael Gallup, uh, how are we feeling now that it's going to be Andy Dalton the rest of the way? I mean, it's a little bit of a step down, right? Like all of us understand that, but still these guys are going to continue to have production. Now, if you look at the numbers from yesterday's game, CeeDee Lamb had eight receptions, 124 yards. He led all wide receivers. Amari Cooper only had two receptions for 23 yards. And then Michael Gallup was second. He had four receptions for 73 yards. All of these guys are going to continue to get targets. They're going to continue to catch the ball, regardless of if it was Dak Prescott or Andy Dalton. So I do think fantasy managers can be you know a little bit upset that they're not going to have the starting quarterback throwing to their receivers but by no means does this, does this mean that these guys are no longer fantasy relevant they are absolutely still fantasy relevant i completely agree with that the i guess if there's an upside i wonder if maybe this means some better things for michael gallup and then like this is sort of speculating because we don't know how things are going to shake out but uh, he had two really big catches on that last drive for the Cowboys, helping them get in, in position for the game-winning field goal. So, yeah, we don't know how Andy Dalton is going to spread the football around, but I do think that with those three guys being as talented as they are, I don't know that you worry too much about him. You're right. Yes, Andy Dalton is not Dak Prescott. That goes without saying. There's a reason he was the backup there in Dallas. But again, the drop-off between the two is not so severe that suddenly you freak out. I mean, I think we have questions now about Terry McLaurin in Washington. If they don't get their quarterback situation straightened out, I don't think you have that level of concern with the guys in Dallas. So we're talking with Eddie we're at the stop at the top of the show about Chase Claypool. And man, did he have a day. Seven catches, 110 yards receiving, four total touchdowns, three through the air, one as a runner, 42.6 fantasy points, depending on your scoring, obviously. But uh, yeah, I know some of it came because Deontay Johnson was hurt. But how do we view Chase Claypool going forward? Okay, so maybe this is just me and maybe we needed to have a segment called Overreaction Theater. The second that game ended, I went to the waiver wire and put a claim on Chase Claypool because I have Juju Smith in one of my leagues. I'm in a 16-team uh, league, which is really, you know, it's, it's stretched thin at a lot of the positions. <laughs> and having Juju, I wanted to go and I wanted to pick up the guy who's going to play opposite of him. Now, Chase Claypool had seven reception in yesterday's game, but in the last three games combined, he had six. 
So it just goes to show that the volume is is peaking for him. And it was a little bit of a surprise because we thought that Deontay Johnson and Juju Smith would come back and be fully healthy. Obviously, Deontay Johnson left the game early again with an injury. But uh, Mike Tomlin went on in the media presser to say that Claypool was just the guy in yesterday's game, but they feel very comfortable with their receiving core and they feel comfortable continuing to give him opportunities. So I know maybe it was a little naive to go run and claim him, but I think if you put up those numbers and you have Big Ben as your quarterback, a guy who can air out the ball, a guy who can, you know, throw it to you in the slot, that means all good things, you know. I'm concerned about Juju and to see the points that he put up while Chase Claypool put up his 40 something points. That's why I ran and that's why I got concerned. So I hope that this continues and I hope that my waiver wire claim on him gets approved and then I can win my fantasy championship. <laughs> We're definitely going to talk about Juju later in the show because I have concerns. So we'll, we'll get to that before this show is over. And I don't think it was naive to go run into the waiver wire to put in a claim on Chase Claypool. I suspect there are a lot of fantasy managers who did that exact same thing during that game on Sunday. It's, it, it's enticing. It is exciting to see how the Steelers are using him. It's certainly exciting to see that Ben Roethlisberger obviously trusts him. They want to use him as a deep threat, get him down the field for some of those pop plays. I mean, he had four touchdowns yesterday, didn't have a single end zone target. So a lot of these were, were big catches and runs. That is a little bit concerning just because it seems like it's going to be unsustainable. I also kind of worry about what his usage is going to be when Deontay Johnson is back and healthy. Will he get the same number of targets? That seems kind of hard to believe. But the fact is he's on the field a lot. And with what he did on Sunday, you got to believe his role is going to increase in the offense. So it, it is definitely worth making him a high priority waiver claim. Depending on your situation, he might not be your number one claim, but he should be pretty high on the list. I do think he's going to be one of the more added players by the time we get to uh, the start of week six, which uh, I guess is Thursday, Saturday. Wednesday, I don't know. Thursday, that's a whole different. Friday, Saturday. That's a, that's a that's a whole different conversation. We we need to have a segment. Time. Which we need to have a segment. Which week is it? Which end of all week is which it? Which week? I know we just spin a wheel. Which week is it? Yeah, that'll be uh, <laughs> that that's gonna be a whole thing. Uh, which, by the way, I, I don't know if I'm sure that you know a lot of you out there saw on Twitter uh, the updated schedule or the schedule changes that the league has made in light of having to move some games around. Uh, I am not going to pretend to be able to get into all of those and, and be able to clearly explain them to you. But if you are handy with a web search function, I'm sure you can find that information and you can try and make a spreadsheet or a graph or just one of those, you know, homicide charts with the lines and stuff all over it and, uh, you know, see if, uh, see if you can kind of figure it out yourself. All right, let's get to this because this is going to hurt my soul for a minute. But Ryan Fitzpatrick and the Dolphins just blew the 49ers out of the water in Santa Clara on Sunday. I don't think anybody saw that coming, but the Niners downed uh, some starters in their secondary. They had to call up an emergency uh, practice squad guy, Brian Allen. He did not have a great time, was torched by Preston Williams. The Dolphins rolled offensively. Uh, Brian Fitzpatrick, Miles Gaskin, Preston Williams all had 20-plus fantasy points. Now, I know maybe not all of these guys are week-to-week -week starters, but, Kimmy, at some point, we got to start believing that some of these Dolphins belong in fantasy lineups more consistently, right? Well, I understand that some of these guys are going to be a flex pay and flex play, excuse me, and they're a week by week starter contingency basis. I think all of that is true except for Ryan Fitzpatrick. Now, we talked earlier. Dak Prescott is out for the season. We've seen some other injuries and changes at the quarterback position. Ryan Fitzpatrick, if we did not make the case for him a few weeks back when he went and completely crushed Gardner Minshew and he, he proved that the mustache is better. No, wait, the beard is better than the mustache. Now <laughs> we completely need to believe it. He had 350 passing yards, three passing touchdowns. At one point in the game, he had a perfect passer rating. Miles Gaskin and Preston Williams, they also had huge flashes of opportunity and really Really, really, really good performances. Mile Gaskin had 16 rushing attempts, 57 yards, and a touchdown. Preston Williams also got in the end zone on four receptions and 106 yards. So I absolutely think we need to take this offense seriously. One, I think Ryan Fitzpatrick needs to be a starting fantasy quarterback week by week. If you look at their upcoming schedule, they have a lot of favorable matchups. They go and they take on the Broncos. Then they take on the Rams. That's probably their toughest one yet. Then they take on the Jets, the Chargers, the Cardinals, and back to the Jets. 
Look at that schedule. Look at what those teams have been able to do against high-powered offenses. And the answer is not a lot. I think we have to understand that the Miami Dolphins are actually a pretty decent football team. It's surprising to a lot of us, but they should be considered starters. It's a fun offense to watch. I just There's just no way around it. It is fun to watch. I, the guy we that I didn't mention in there is, is Devontae Parker, and he had a touchdown as well. Maybe he didn't have the 20-point game, but he continues to be a big part of their passing game as well. Oh, it was say, sort of good same to see. With, same, yeah. with, same with Mike Gusecki. He was tight end number four, I think, on the right. week. It's like we have, to, we have to, at a certain point, like get rid of all the shade of being like, oh, the Miami Dolphins are not a good team. <laughs> Start everyone against the Dolphins and say, no, no, no. Actually, you should be starting the Dolphins against everyone else. It's, it's wild. Didn't think we would be here five weeks into the 2020 season. Certainly didn't think we'd still be talking about Ryan Fitzpatrick as a fantasy-relevant quarterback. I mean, we were all figuring at some point Tua Tagovailoa was going to take over, and that, and that very well could still happen. But right now, Fitzpatrick is making a strong case to stay in that job. And I would say that for our greedy, selfish fantasy perspective, I kind of want to see it just because there's that consistency. We know – how he distributes the football. We know that it's going to go to, to Williams and Parker and Gasicki. We know that. And you know, having to bring a new quarterback in sort of creates some uncertainty, which we don't like. We don't like uncertainty <laughs> when it comes to fantasy football. So I do think we got to take these guys seriously. They're playing really good football. They're fun to watch. And, and they have some really young, interesting pieces. And at some point, we'll see Tua, and that will be great as well. But let's just keep this gravy train going as long as we possibly can. All right. Today's show is brought to you by DraftKings, the leader in one-day fantasy sports. DraftKings has millions of dollars in total prizes up for grabs this week. So download the DraftKings app, DraftKings app now. Use code TEAM during sign-up. Start feeling the sweat like never before. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com for details. We come back. We're going to play a little round of breakout or fake out. Three guys who had good week five performances, whether or not it's real or fake. Take a break, come back with more of the NFL Fantasy Football Show. It's time for Performance Ready, presented by Castrol Edge. It's Monday, so we always do Checks Marks the Spot with Kimmy Checks. We got three players, we discussed them. Uh, this week is a little bit different. We're going to do what we're calling Breakout or fake out. Shout out to uh, Hytham Kalani for coming up with that one. Uh, some guys who played well in week five, and, and we'll try to figure out whether or not this is actually real or uh, if this was just a really happy accident for one week. So let's start with Derek Carr, who I know uh, I know you, you don't necessarily want to relive this, but had a really good game against the Kansas City Chiefs. And for me, the biggest thing was that Derek Carr, who's been sort of uh, besmirched, as Adam Rank would say, for not throwing the ball deep downfield, threw the ball deep downfield on a number of occasions and had a pretty good week. So when you look at what he did against the Chiefs, breakout or fake out? You know what, and I swear I'm not saying this because I'm biased, but I absolutely do think that this is a fake out. I think this is probably the ceiling game for Derek Carr. I, I'm by no means besmirching, as Adam Rank also likes to say, his performance. He had a 92 quarterback rating. He had 347 passing yards, three touchdowns, some really good deep balls, um, and his receiving core looked amazing. You know, there was a really fun run and reception by Henry Ruggs. We saw Darren Waller have really good, uh, you know, performance and in, in, in some throws his way. But I really do think that, no, this is completely a fake out. I do think Derek Carr is a fine quarterback. He beat my Kansas City Chiefs. It's whatever. It's water under the bridge. I'm 0% salty, as you can tell. Uh, but no, I think this is absolutely his ceiling game. And a huge part of why I'm not completely buying into this is looking at the schedule ahead for the Las Vegas Raiders. They take on Tom Brady and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Then they take on the Chargers. Then they go back and play the Chiefs. Then they take on the Browns and then the Broncos and then the Falcons. Yes, some of those teams, not so hot. But a lot of those teams are performing really well this season and have really strong defenses. So if Derek Carr wants to continue to do what he did yesterday, he's going to need to step it up even further. So no, it's a fake out and I'm not buying into this Derek Carr hype train. Sorry, I'm over it. <laughs> I think I'm a little closer. I'm not quite as far into the fake out realm, I think, as you are, but I am a little bit closer than I am to break out for Derek Carr. I mean, I do think that what we saw yesterday was was great. I mean, it was a lot of fun to watch because it was it seemed out of character for how he's played in his career and how the Raider offense has played. But I do think that at best, he's kind of a streaming guy. He's a matchup-based starter. He's not a guy that you're suddenly going to 
think, oh, hey, I'm going to plug him in and I'm going to get you know 20 points a week from Derek Carr. I just don't think it's going to happen. You talk about the schedule. There are some there are some soft spots in that schedule. There are games against the Falcons. There are games against the Jets. There are opportunities for Derek Carr to go in there and have big weeks. But I, I still am not sold on him as being more than kind of a QB2. He's a nice, uh, I think, a nice piece to have in two quarterback leagues. But I think in, in most traditional or standard leagues, you're not going to be starting him each and every week. All right, another quarterback, though, Teddy Bridgewater, who I, we all sort of predicted him to go out and have a nice day against the Atlanta Falcons. He did not let us down, did a lot of that work in the first half of that game. Um, but Teddy B, I mean, he had a lot of yards, just not a lot of touchdowns. Is this a breakout or a fake out? It's a breakout, and I know we hyped him up last week, and I'm going to continue to keep the train rolling. Also, before I move on, I'm sorry that I was just so shady to you, Derek Carr, because I don't ever <laughs> want to be shady towards players. I'm really, really, really salty, and I'm very upset over that loss yesterday, so I'm sorry. I still think that you're a fake out, but I'm sorry. I apologize. Okay, on to Teddy Ridgewater. I think this is truly a breakout performance. Yes, he didn't go and put up four passing touchdowns. He only had two touchdowns, but he also had 313 yards, and his receivers played really well. We saw a really good game from DJ Moore, another continued great game from Robbie Anderson, and then Mike Davis, you know, at the running back position, he was one of the top scorers in fantasy football this week. Now, rumors have it that Christian McCaffrey could be back as early as next week in week six. So, you know, then are some questions. Does this now go back to a running offense? And Teddy Bridgewater is not going to throw his balls to his receivers as much. I don't know, and I don't know how that game script is going to change once CMC is back in that starting lineup. But regardless, I think we need to give credit where it's due. And Teddy Bridgewater has been a really good fantasy quarterback these last few weeks. So if you picked him up on the waiver wire, or if you want to continue to stream him contingent on the matchup, you should be happy and feel proud about that decision. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go slightly different from what I said about Derek Carr. I said he I think I'm trending more toward fake out than breakout. I'm, I'm more toward breakout than fake out on Teddy B, but I'm still not all the way there. Uh, I think, again, like my idea of Teddy Bridgewater coming into the season was that he was going to be a streaming option. I still have not completely moved off of that. I do think he played great. I do think he's going to be able to take advantage of matchups. I will say, though, I am more impressed with this Panther passing game than I thought I would be. I didn't think Robbie Anderson was going to be a fit there. He's come in and played very well in the first five weeks of the season. I liked what I saw on Sunday in terms of them getting the ball to DJ Moore as well. He had a nice long catch and run for a touchdown. And you can see that they are really trying to get him the football and get him involved in the action. I also want to see what happens when Christian McCaffrey is back. Mike Davis has been fantastic with McCaffrey injured. But I do want to see what changes or how much this changes with McCaffrey back whether or not they sort of go maybe being a little bit more run-based. But I like what I've seen out of Bridgewater. But again, I don't know that I'm using him as more than a streaming option in a lot of leagues. But I think if I were – so basically if it comes down to – all right, so let me ask you this. If, if you have to pick a streaming quarterback off the wire and you're going to go Derek Carr or Teddy Bridgewater, I mean, I think I know what you're going to say, but I'm going to ask, are you going Teddy B or are you going Derek, Derek Carr? I'm going Teddy B. I'm done with you, Derek Carr. No shade. I'm done with you. But no, I, I honestly do feel like, especially looking at the schedule, I know we said that there are some soft spots for the Las Vegas Raiders when they take on the Jets, they, they take on the Broncos, whose secondary is pretty banged up. Uh, but I really do think it's Teddy Bridgewater. And and that's that's not even a homer pick. That's that's just, it's what I feel in my heart. Okay, Marcus? Oh, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, all right. So our last one here on Breakout or Fake Out, uh, Brandon Cooks. Last week, he had zero catches for zero yards. That's not great. This week, he had all of the catches for all of the yards. Uh, he had like 12 targets. He had a huge game. I know this Texans offense is sort of hard to figure, although I still feel like Brandon Cooks and Will Fuller are the top two, top, top two options in the passing game. But after what we saw from Brandon Cooks on Sunday, are you feeling like it's a breakout or a fake out? I'm going to pull a U and just say yes. I feel like it's either one of them. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just coast in the middle on this one and going to say yes because you're right. You know, he had 161 receiving yards and a touchdown. I think all of us thought that this was going to be a Wolf Fuller game, but then Brandon Cooks came in and stepped up. But my only problem here is that he's been inconsistent through five games, gaining 25 yards or fewer on three of those occasions in those matchups. So it's really hard for me to figure out 
who is Brandon Cooks and what is he going to look like on a week to week basis. I think that he could put up some team numbers every single week, maybe like 12, 13, 14 fantasy points. You know, hopefully you want to have another 30 plus fantasy point performance out of him. But you're right. I think Will Fuller is going to be the wide receiver one. And then Brandon Cooks is close behind him. But I also think Kenny Stills is going to get some looks and some opportunities. Now, we don't know what's going to change with the coaching change that just took place last week. They have the interim you know, head coach in place right now. Um, but I don't know. It's really hard to put my put my finger on exactly what Brandon Cooks is going to look like as well as the rest of this receiving core. So it's a yes for me. It's it's a yes. It's a breakout or a fake out. It's just, <laughs> he played well. He played well on Sunday. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to... I'm going to regret this, but I'm going to say it's a breakout. I'm going to say this is the start of some good things for Brandon Cooks. I, I know we were sort of all on this idea this past week that with the coaching change, that the Texans would basically just put the ball in the hands of Deshaun Watson and let him work. And I still think that's going to be the basic game plan going forward. And I think it bodes well for his receivers. We know that Deshaun Watson likes to go downfield. That's why Will Fuller was kind of a nice mid-round value pick. That's why Brandon Cooks has some had some late-round fantasy draft value. And so I, I'm going to go with say that this is the start of something pretty good. Now, obviously, it's not going to be 160 yards good every week, but I think there's going to be more opportunity there. And I think we're going to look back and that zero game was going to sort of be just kind of a, a speed bump. And we're going to say, hey, the Brandon Cooks had a pretty good year. So I'm going to start to buy in. Now I could come back in a couple of weeks and, you know, have completely put my foot in my mouth. I, I, I'm not I'm not ruling that out. But I, I'm going to say that this is going to be sort of a breakout here for Brandon Cooks. Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. Let's see. Let's see. I, I think every my answer we'll from here out is always just going to be yes to everything because then no one can come at me on on Twitter and and say I was wrong. So you are learning, young Padawan. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, by the way, Kimmy's got the poll out on her Twitter account. You can go find it at Kimmy Checks on Twitter. The question being, which of these three guys, which performance gives you the most confidence going forward? So go and vote there and uh, make your voice be heard. And maybe if there's somebody else that has you really all excited about what they did in week five, you can uh, drop that respectfully in the comments, please. Uh, there you go. That was Performance Ready presented by Castrol Edge. We'll be back. Take a look at your waiver wire picks coming up into week six on the NFL Fantasy Football Show. With a game on Tuesday, it means that your league's waiver wire run might be a little bit different than it would in a normal week, but it doesn't mean you can't go and start putting in claims for guys right now. So we've got our list of some week six waiver wire targets. In fact, let's go and look at that list there. Uh, you got Andy Dalton at the quarterback spot. We talked about him with Dak Prescott now out for the season. Chase Edmonds, Alexander Madison, a couple of running backs you might want to keep an eye on. Of course, Chase Claypool will be a popular name after his four touchdown game on Sunday. Travis Fulgham, but a really big game for the Eagles. He is going to be, I think, a coveted guy on the waiver wire, especially in deeper leagues. Henry Ruggs had a couple of long catches against the Chiefs, and we're starting to remember why the Raiders drafted him so highly. And then Cedric Wilson, who the last couple of weeks is starting to get some run in that Cowboy offense. It might be a little bit crowded, but I think if you're in a deep league where you need some help at the wide receiver position, Cedric Wilson is kind of a low priority waiver guy to keep an eye on. But the, uh, can you, let's talk a little bit about Alexander Madison, because Dalvin Cook uh, was injured in the Sunday night game against the Seahawks, had a groin injury. We're still waiting further information on how serious that might be. But Madison came in, played very well. And I would think that this is a week where people are going to need running backs. Alexander Madison, I would imagine, is going to be a very popular name for folks. He's going to be a huge popular name, and he's actually going to be one of my top priorities on the waiver wire this week. He had 20 rushing attempts, 112 rushing yards. And yes, I understand that he got a lot of those opportunities because Dalvin Cook went on the sideline with an injury. Even though he did return to the game, he wasn't as productive as Madison was. Now, we have to realize Madison was also good last season. Okay, like he was good last season. He's also a really good running back this season. So even if Dalvin Cook is healthy all season and he continues to play, I think that because the running back position is spread so thin this season with injuries, bye weeks, canceled, postponed games, you need to make sure that you have really good handcuffs. And I think Alex excuse me, Alexander Madison is a handcuff player that you should absolutely pick up and look to target on the waiver wire, especially as they go up next week against the Atlanta Falcons, who have not been so hot, as we all know. 
why wouldn't you want to have Lynn Manuel Miranda's favorite running back, Alexander <laughs> Madison? I mean, on your roster. Uh, when we were talking during the preseason about needing to expand your fantasy rosters because of COVID and that sort of thing, Alexander Madison's name kept coming up as one of the prime examples. If you draft Alvin Cook, if you have a deep enough roster, you want to go get Alexander Madison. Now, he's available, shockingly, in about 90% of NFL.com leagues. So I don't know if it's just that people had short benches. It couldn't afford to hold the roster spot for a guy who wasn't getting consistent touches. But Alexander Madison should be on a lot of rosters. And especially if Dalvin Cook has to miss time, he's going to be a very popular ad coming up this week. So I think that's certainly a name to keep in mind. But it might be worth if you have the roster space of just hanging on to him and, and, and seeing whether or not he ends up getting a larger role down the line. We know they love Dalvin Cook, but at some point they may also want to look to sort of give him uh, a break every once in a while. And that could mean Madison ends up getting on the field and getting some touches for uh, for the Vikings. Uh, another running back name that is going to be important is Chase Edmonds. And this, Kimmy, is more than just an injury thing. I mean, I, you know, Kenyon Drake is still healthy. He's just not playing well. And Chase Edmonds is out playing him. I mean, I'm really starting to think that I might want to get Chase Edmonds. And maybe if the situation's right, uh, consider him as a flex because that that's just seems to be what it is right now in Arizona. I mean, it is what it is. It's so funny. When Chase Edmonds had his touchdown yesterday, our producer Hyphen texted me because we were talking on Sunday show about Chase Edmonds and Kenyon Drake and what is going on. And the second he scored, Hyphen was like, oh my gosh, what is happening? And I really think it means that Chase Edmonds enters the conversation as someone who, like you said, should possibly be started in a flex spot on a week-to-week basis. He had three rushing attempts for 36 yards. He had one 29-yard beautiful touchdown as well as five catches catches for 56 yards against the New York Jets. Now, Kenyon Drake on the other side of that ball, or not on the other side, another guy in that offense, he had 18 rushing attempts, 60 yards, and he finally got in the end zone. Now, uh, Cliff Kingsbury said in the post-game pressure, he said nothing but good things about Chase Edmonds, which continues to show me that I want to think that they're going to continue to use him in this offense. They said not only can he run the ball, but he also has really good pass-catching ability with Kenyon Drake kind of fading out. Out, I think that Chase Edmonds enters the conversation and should be a guy who we should target to start on a week-to-week -week basis. I've noticed that the disparity in snaps between the two of them is getting smaller steadily by the week. And I went back and watched that Cardinals-Jets game late last night, and there was just a difference between the two guys. I mean, Kenyon Drake looked hesitant trying to get to the hole. He just was sort of stutter-stepping, didn't look decisive. Chase Edmonds was a lot more decisive, find the hole and go. And at some point, I, I know the Cardinals really want to get Kenyon Drake going, but it just doesn't seem to be working. And I just wonder how long they're going to continue to give Kenyon Drake so many snaps and so many touches when Chase Edmonds continues to be productive. At the very least, though, uh, in a week where look, we, we've got a lot of buys coming up, right? And we've got a lot of key buys. I think the Saints are off. The Seahawks are off. The Chargers are off. There are going to be, I think the Raiders are off. So that means you're looking at some serious fantasy running backs, right? I mean, that means no Kamara, no Josh Jacobs, uh, no Joshua Kelly, uh, you know, no, no Chris Carson. People are going to be in need of running backs this week. So Chase Edmonds, I think, is going to end up being a very, very popular name. So you mentioned uh, you, you might make Alexander Madison one of your top priorities. Would he be your number one or is there another guy that you might put above him? You know what? No, I think he's absolutely going to be my number one because we actually don't know what's happening with Dalvin Cook. We understand that that news will probably come out later today uh, or at least by midweek to understand for, you know, the next Sunday's matchup if he is healthy and if he is a go or not. Even if he is healthy, I do think, like you said, Alexander Madison is such a good handcuff. And the fact that he's not owned in 90% of NFL.com leagues goes to show that a lot of people are kind of flying under the radar on this guy. So I want to go try to target him and get him. And hopefully he lifts me up to fantasy gold. Absolutely using my top waiver priority if I have it on Alexander Madison. Uh, Chase Edmonds would probably be right behind him just because, again, this is going to be, I think, a tough week for people when it comes to running backs. They're going to need some running back help. Chase Claypool will be a close third and hoping that he keeps some of that target share with the, with the Steelers offense. Is there anybody that we didn't name on this list that maybe you, you have an eye on? I went through 
not sort of a not a great week for waiver wire targets, but I don't know if there's somebody you feel like we have to mention that we didn't. No, I mean, I think the list is really comprehensive this week. It's so hard because, like you said, there are so many different bye weeks happening that even if there is a guy that you wanted to target on the waiver wire, you look and say, oh, well, he has a bye week, and then they have a really tough matchup, so it's really hard. So I think this list is good, um, and I, you know, right after we're done, I want to go and head to the waiver wire and really start to start making some claims because I need to make sure that I'm getting in a position. You know, we're getting to a point in the fantasy football season where, you know, you could lose your chance of going to the playoffs if you have not been winning your match on a week to week basis. So I want to be locked and loaded so I can beat you and I can beat Adam Rank and I can beat all you other cats and then brag all off season long. I tweeted on Sunday morning that playing fantasy this season is sort of like playing solitaire with two cards missing from the deck, but the two cards that are missing change every time you shuffle the deck. And so <laughs> I think for for that reason it really is important to go out and try to be aggressive on the waiver wire, uh, maybe to try to make trades where, when and where you can. I, I know the schedule is continually shifting. You know, they had a lot of changes that they announced on Sunday. Look, I mean, just common sense tells you that there will probably be more changes to come because we don't know how this thing is going to play out. So where you can go and try to get some potential waiver wire heroes, uh, I strongly suggest that you go and do that as best as you can. All right, we'll hit a break. We'll come back and we'll talk about some guys that, you know, maybe should end up on the waiver wire or at least on your bench in the weeks to come. We're going to ask if this is the end for some of these fantasy football guys as we return on the NFL Fantasy Football Show presented by DraftKings. Hey, if you haven't already, you should go and like and subscribe our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash NFL Fantasy Football. You can get live streaming shows like this one or NFL Fantasy Live. You can get it at NFL Fantasy Game Day, NFL Fantasy Bites, all sorts of great videos and shows there at our YouTube channel. We've already got over 25,000 subscribers. So join the crowd. Come get your fantasy knowledge. Come have a little fun. Uh, it's great, Kimmy. I mean, I, I feel like there's a lot of really good quality stuff up there for people. It's all good quality stuff, and it's what all the cool kids are doing. So go ahead over to youtube.com slash NFL Fantasy Football. Anything that you can imagine that's fantasy football related for this season and even beyond, it's there. It's myself, Marcus Grant, Adam Rank, Michael Florio, and a whole host of other people. Uh, so come and get all the content. And hey, if you're lucky, maybe we'll respond and talk to you in the comments because I think that's one of the really fun things about fantasy football and, and why people enjoy our videos and enjoy us on socials that we interact and we respond to our fans and, and we really want to help everyone bring home a fantasy championship. So go like and subscribe and uh, we'll talk to you there. We will hopefully talk to you there. We'll see you there. You'll see us there. Something like that. <laughs> All right. There are guys who are not just doing it for us in fantasy. I mean, it, it happens every year. There are guys that underperform that we start to get a little bit panicky about. And now that we are five weeks into the season, I think we have a little more clarity on a handful of guys. So I'm going to ask whether or not uh, this is the end, in the in the wise words of New Edition. Is this the end? Okay, I, I won't. I promise I won't do that again. That was, I'm sure, disturbing to a lot of people. Um, But let's go down the list. Matt Ryan who the first couple of weeks of the season, Matt Ryan was was bananas. I mean, it was great. The last three weeks have not been great. And on Sunday, it was just awful against the Carolina Panthers. And I'm starting to get tweets asking if Matt Ryan is droppable in, in generally a 10 and 12 team leagues. I mean, Kimmy, is, is it a wrap for Matty Ice or is this just sort of a hiccup right now? I mean, I think it may be a wrap, but maybe not. Again, I'm going to like skirt the fine line of yes on this one. You talked about his first few performances of the season. He put up 23 fantasy points and then he put up 28 fantasy points. These last three weeks, he hasn't been able to put up more than 13 fantasy points. And he also has only thrown one touchdown in the last three games. Now, not only does this raise a question of Matt Ryan and his ability, but then it raises a question of what do we do with Calvin Ridley and then a healthy Julio Jones? Thankfully, Calvin Ridley had another monster game, and we're hoping that Julio can be back and healthy and playing. I, I'm concerned about Matt Ryan. His next few games are up against the Vikings and then the Lions. I think those are decent matchups, so I don't know if I want to fully put Matty on ice yet. But, you know, if you have a 2QB league and you have a better streaming option who has a better matchup, maybe it's time for you to look at him over Matt Ryan. I am starting to downgrade Matt Ryan to 
it's a streaming guy. Uh, I, I thought maybe he was just the volume would sort of keep him afloat. That hasn't happened. But I also go back and look the last three weeks. Uh, they played, the, you know, on Sunday it was the Panthers who have been surprisingly tough on quarterbacks this year. They played the Packers who have a pretty good defense and they played the Bears. So I'm willing to sort of chalk it up to a combination of playing three good defenses, not having Julio Jones, either not having him at full speed or not having him at all. So I can't just release Matt Ryan back into the wild because of that. You mentioned they've, they've got the foul or the, the Vikings coming up. And that Viking secondary has been problematic all year long. So this feels like a get right opportunity for Matt Ryan coming up in week six. So that's the reason I can't quite give up on him the week after that. He's got the Lions, which is another pretty favorable matchup. But I am certainly at a point where I don't think I want to start Matt Ryan on a week to week basis because it's showing that, you know, he just isn't going to be that productive guy every single week now. We do have the new coach conundrum, right? If last week we were all about the Texans and, and Deshaun Watson and their offense because they have a new coach, I don't know if we feel the same way about Matt Ryan. I don't know. But I do think that I, I'm not just going to be comfortable with making him a set it and forget it sort of starter. I think I think right now he really is a, a streaming streaming option at best, I think, in a lot of fantasy leagues. So you mentioned Juju Smith-Schuster earlier in the show. You were talking about Chase Claypool, how you went and put in a waiver claim for him because you have Juju. It has not been a great year for Juju. He had a touchdown in, in week one, but on the whole, it's just been kind of a down year. I mean, what are we doing? Are we putting him back on the waiver wire? Are we just benching him? I mean, how, how, how are you handling your Juju situation? Okay, well, one, I am crossing my fingers and putting everything up to the fantasy gods so that my waiver wire claim on Chase Kaipool gets accepted and then I can stash and have both of them on my team. Now, the one thing that I will say about Juju and why I don't want to be quick to just put him on the bench or put her out, put him out there on the waiver wire or see if I can get any type of trade for him is because it's unclear that if his performance yesterday was slowed by that knee issue that he has been dealing with. But regardless of that injury, he has now failed to surpass 50 receiving yards in his last three games. Now, next week they take on the Cleveland Browns, who are actually really good this season and tough against a wide receiver position. So I don't, I, I really don't know what to do here. It, it's really a head scratcher and it sucks because it was such a tease. I think his very first game of the season, he put up over 28 fantasy points and I was like, yes, Juju is back. He's going to be dominant. This is why I put an early spin on him, but now he's kind of let me down. So I think it'll be interesting. I think, you know, if there's any positive in the Deontay Johnson, you know, injury and him still not being fully healthy is that Juju really does have to step it up if they want to score points. But I think Chase Claypool has the opportunity to be just as good. So it's kind of a toss-up for me what concerns me about juju is sort of what we saw in the the highlight package that was running that that a lot of these throws a lot of these catches he's making are on short throws a lot of underneath throws they're using claypool we know as a deep threat even deontay johnson is more of a field stretcher so those air yards are there for those guys they haven't seemed to be there for juju and i think that's part of the reason you have you see him struggle to get to 50 receiving yards because you know, he's just not getting the target volume to sort of make up for it. The Steelers are spreading the football around. They're finding new wide receiver targets. So it does sort of worry me. I'm Again, I, I, I'm not ready to kind of give up on him yet because I think there are big days coming. But I think, again, he's right now he's down to a flex at best for me. And I think you're sort of playing matchups when it looks like the Steelers are going to have to throw the football a lot. This is not what you drafted him as. You were hoping to get maybe a high-end wide receiver two, or maybe a, a low-end wide receiver one if things worked out right. But I, I think at this point in the season, it's fair to say that that ship may have sailed and, and Juju's just not going to give you the kind of numbers weekly that you were hoping that he would get for you. Speaking of not giving you weekly numbers, Mark Ingram. And I, I'm, I'm singling out Mark Ingram here, but I could probably expand this to the Baltimore Ravens running backs as a whole because you got Mark Ingram and J.K. Dobbins and Gus Edwards. All these guys are almost splitting snaps equally. They're splitting touches and carries equally. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to ask you about Mark Ingram, but I guess this kind of goes across the board. Uh, how, are we, how are we valuing these, these Ravens running backs now? I think we're not really valuing them at all. And if we want to grab anyone from the Ravens offense, it wants to be a receiver. It wants to be a tight end or just Lamar Jackson or maybe even their defense. Because like you said, Mark Ingram was the lead back yesterday and he had less than six fantasy points, right? He had 11 carries for 57 rushing yards. But like you said, it's not just Mark Ingram. It's the entire running back situation. In yesterday's game, 
Not a single Ravens running back exceeded 60 scrimmage yards or scored a touchdown, even though the three of them had a combined 160 rushing yards. So it just goes to show that the game script is not favorable at the running back position. If you have a Mark Ingram, if you have a Gus Edwards, if you have a J.K. Dobbins and you're starting them week by week, I'm sure you're getting absolutely burned in your fantasy numbers. And that's because these running backs, for them to score points, they're very touchdown dependent. And sadly, the game script is not favor running backs getting into the end zone. I had high hopes for Mark Ingram. I, I really thought that there was still going to be at least one solid year left. Now, I thought J.K. Dobbins was set to take over maybe end of this year, more into next season. But right now, the Ravens are content to use all these guys. I mean, let's let's not throw Gus Edwards under the bus here. Gus the bus? Uh, I didn't mean to do that, <laughs> but hey, it works out. Uh, I mean, look, he, he is a good running back who I think would get a lot more attention on any other team. But he's on a team that wants to run the football, that is going to be uh, effective running the football. And through all this, you still have Lamar Jackson, who's going to run the ball as well. I, I, I don't know if you can get anything from Mark Ingram in a trade without having to package him with a couple of other guys. Uh, you know, I, I, I almost think it might be worth putting him out, out there on the waiver wire. And maybe there's a big game coming, but he really is incredibly touchdown dependent. I think at this point, I think for me, I'm just chalking this up as a miss. And I think I just move on from Mark Ingram and, and say, hey, you know, it's just not going to work out this year. That's, that's what it is. Tyler Higby was a guy that a lot of people liked. I, I knew I, I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Something made me nervous about it. Then on Sunday, Gerald Everett ends up having a big game. Tyler Higby was kind of missing in action. And aside from his one huge game early in the season against the Bills, we haven't seen much from Tyler Higby. I know we talk about tight ends being sort of volatile, Kimmy. Are, are we ready to completely give up on Higby or are we still giving him a shot? You know what? I am going to give up on Higby in the same 16-man league that my fiance and I play in, which is very competitive, <laughs> as anyone would understand. I had Tyler Higby starting, and I also had Juju Smith-Schuster starting yesterday, and they got me absolutely nothing. And then on my bench, I had Jimmy Graham. Jimmy Graham had less than 10 fantasy points, but again, it was better than Tyler Higby's three fantasy points. I think yesterday's performance goes to show that Gerald Everett is the number one tight end in that offense, and Tyler Higby is a number two. I do not think that Jared Goff throws the ball enough for both of those tight ends to be fantasy relevant. So for me, I'm putting Tyler Higby out there on the waiver wire or at least putting him on my bench because I just don't think that his fantasy numbers or his fantasy performances are going to clinch me any type of win or any way to be competitive on a week-to-week -week basis. Right now, I think there are a handful of tight ends. I think you, know, you got Travis Kelsey, Darren Waller, I think to some extent, George Kittle as well, uh, Mark Andrews. I think those are the guys that if you have them, you're pretty much set at tight end. Most everybody else, you're probably streaming the position. So that means I think you can put Tyler Higby out on the waiver wire. You can find somebody whose matchup you like a little bit better this week. And the thing about Higby is that he's not really running as many routes as you would expect. They're using him a lot as a blocker. I mean, he's on the field quite a bit, but he's not necessarily going out and, and in a position to catch the football. And then you also have to throw in the fact that now you have the Gerald Everett game to contend with every once in a while. And I, I'm with you. I think I think I might just be letting Tyler Higby go to the waiver wire. And if somebody picks him up, then so be it. But I think I'm going to just take my chances and try to stream the position and, and see what I can get from there. Because it is not it's not working out. Just sort of like all the other guys in this segment. <laughs> it's just not it's just not working out. You know, inspired by ongoing conversations with players, the NFL, NFL Players Association, and Players Coalition together launched NFL Votes to empower and improve our communities through exercising the right to vote. Join the NFL family by registering to vote today and make your voice heard this November. Visit NFL.com slash votes to learn more. We'll wrap up the show with a preview of Monday Night Football and Tuesday Night Football as well. Stick around for more of the NFL Fantasy Football Show presented by DraftKings. There are still two games to be played in week five. We are not done by far. Normally, we just have a Monday night game, but now we have a Monday night and a Tuesday night game. So uh, let's dive into those. First, we'll start with the Monday night game, the Chargers and the Saints. And we know Austin Eckler is out for the foreseeable future for the Chargers with an injury. So they've got a couple guys that they're going to rotate back there. Who would you rather start, Kimmy, if you had the choice, Joshua Kelly or Justin Jackson? 
I'm going to go with Joshua Kelly on this one because he is absolutely the number one back in that offense. And I understand that him and Jackson split carries almost, you know, tandem 50-50 last week. But I really do think it's Joshua Kelly. Now, I understand it's a tough matchup against the Saints, who didn't give much up on the ground against the Lions. But I'm expecting Kelly to have RB2 type of numbers. So crossing my fingers there because I picked him up uh, a few weeks ago on the waiver wire. So please perform well for me tonight. <laughs> I am, I'm leaning toward Kelly as well. I think that what gives him the edge for me is the touchdown upside potential that they are going to use him near the goal line. I've been saying for weeks that he did not come in to be the Austin Eckler in this offense. He came in to be the Melvin Gordon, and they are using him as such. Now, he needs to hold on to the football. Ball security has been an issue for him the last couple of weeks, and that, that could, could completely derail everything if he fumbles the ball. Then we could end up seeing more Justin Jackson, but... I, I just think that when they get down near the end zone, it's going to be Kelly on the field and Kelly with the ball. And that touchdown upside gives him a, a slight edge for me. Now, on the other side, there's no Michael Thomas. He is suspended for this one. It's not an injury situation. Reports are Michael Thomas got in a fight at practice with a teammate. And so that is the reason the Saints are not going to have him available tonight. So with him out of the lineup for one more week, is there a Saints receiver that you trust more than the others? It's funny because when, when I was looking and, and answering this question, it's funny because my very first instinct was to be like, Alvin Kamara, because not only has he been utilized <laughs> as a running back, but also as a pass catcher. But if I had to truly look at the wide receiver position, I'm picking between Traquan Smith and Emmanuel Sanders. I'm going to go with Traquan Smith on this one. I know all season long I've been talking about Emmanuel Sanders and wanting for him to be really good, and he has been good. And the two of these guys are tied with 17 targets each in games without Michael Thomas, but something in my gut tells me that Trey Con Smith is going to usurp him and be the more dominant wide receiver in tonight's matchup. Trick question. The answer is actually Taysom Hill. No, I'm <laughs> yeah, literally. Um, it's the utility next player. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to go Traquan as well. He he and Drew Brees seem to have a, a pretty nice connection when Michael Thomas isn't there. And he's, again, he's more of a downfield guy. I want those guys who are going to pick up those air yards, who are going to get some of those longer throws and, and have it, you know, so that you don't need as many targets and don't need as many receptions to put up a decent yardage total. Emmanuel Sanders looked good his last time out, but I, I still think he's uh, kind of more of a wild card. I think this is a passing game that is going to run primarily through Alvin Kamara, but I think Traquan Smith and Jerry Cook get a lot of the other targets there. So that's the guy that if I had to pick a Saints wide receiver that I'm going to go with. All right, let's move to the Tuesday game. Bills at Titans. This thing has been sort of in flux for a while, but it looks like it's going to be played on Tuesday. So now Zach Moss is hopefully going to play in this one, but Devin Singletary looked good last time around. So would you go back to the well with Devin Singletary, even if Zach Moss is on the field? You know, I, I would. I know that's a little bit of a risky play. And with Zach Moss coming back into this offense, if he does play, that truly means they go back to a running back committee. I do think that Zach Moss is going to get those short yarded rushes, excuse me, short yardage rushes. Uh, but Devin Singletary has proved himself. And you have to look at the proof is in the pudding. And that is exactly what he's done. So you know what? I feel comfortable starting him as a low end RB2 this week. I would like him as an RB2, especially because he's going to catch the football like we see uh, in this video, that, that he's catching the ball out of the backfield. I, I still want them to give him more goal line touches. It was great to see him get in the end zone against the Raiders, but I want more of that. I'm afraid that Zach Moss is sort of going to take that, but hopefully what they saw out of him a couple weeks ago gives them the confidence to let him have those opportunities because the usage rates are pretty good. The fact that they target him, that's pretty good. It's the fact that he doesn't score touchdowns that's concerning, but hopefully uh, things have started to change a little bit. So I'm with you. I would, I would like him uh, as an RB2 if I can. All right, last bit. Uh, A.J. Brown has been out with an injury for a while now, but he is expected to suit up and play on Tuesday night. If he does go, would you start him? Well, I mean, if you're all the way looking to Tuesday's game and you haven't had a wide receiver who's played, yes, chances are you absolutely do need to go start A.J. Brown. And, you know, I think the one positive note for this is that they've gotten two extra days to get him healthy after not being back and playing since week one. You know, when he did play, he had a really good first week game. So, yeah, if you're in a position where you need to play a wide receiver, you can go ahead and feel comfortable with A.J. Brown and hope that he has a fully healthy bounce back game against the Bills.
the the passing game has pretty much gone through well for a while it was Corey davis and, and john new smith Corey davis is on the covid list he's not going to be available so that means that it shifts back to aj brown being the number one receiver for the Tennessee Titans. So if he's on the field for Tennessee, he's going to be in my fantasy lineup. Uh, I say this as somebody who has had him in a couple of spots and has been waiting patiently to get him back in. So I am sort of itching to get the AJ Brown back in my lineup because I do think he's going to get plenty of targets from Ryan Tannehill and he is worth, look, he, he, there's a reason that people loved him as a breakout guy this year. So you drafted him, you've waited all this time. You might as well get him in your lineup if he's playing because otherwise, what are you even doing? <laughs> uh, what we are doing is uh, getting ready to sign off this show. That is it. We are done. We appreciate you hanging out with the NFL Fantasy Football Show presented by DraftKings. You know the drill. Tell two friends to tell two friends. Rate, review, and remember, if one glass of wine is good for you, imagine what a whole bottle can do. Be safe, take care of yourselves, wear a mask, and we will see you on Wednesday. 